Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar, TOPS. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Justin White, a tobacco control researcher at the University of California, San Francisco. TOPS is being organized by myself, Catherine McLean from Temple University, Mike Pesco from Georgia State University, and Si Shang from The Ohio State University. The seminar will be one hour with questions asked by the moderator and discussant. The audience may pose questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments meeting seminar, seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they're not read aloud. Your comments are much appreciated. The presentation is being video recorded and will be available on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's seminar, uh, today's moderator, Catherine McLean from Temple to introduce our speaker. Today, uh, Professor Hunt Alcott will lead a single, pa a single paper presentation entitled Optimal Regulation of um, E-Cigarettes, Theory and Evidence. Professor Alcott is an applied microeconomist who studies topics in behavioral economics, environmental economics, public economics, and industrial organization. He is a senior principal researcher at Microsoft Research, a visiting associate professor and visiting scholar in economics at Harvard University in 2020 to 2021, a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research, and a co-editor of the Journal of Public Economics. He is a scientific director of Ideas 42, a think tank that applies insights from psychology and economics to business and policy design problems, an affiliate of Poverty Action Lab, a network of researchers who use randomized evaluations to answer critical policy questions in the fight against poverty, and a faculty affiliate of E2E, a group of economists, engineers, and behavioral scientists focused on evaluating and improving energy efficiency policy. He was a contributing author, author on the fifth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Professor Alcott holds a PhD from Harvard University and a BS and an MS from Stanford University. Professor Alcott will be joined by his co-author, Charlie Rafkin, a PhD student in the Economics Department at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, who will answer audience questions in the Q&A. Our discussant today is Mike Pasco. Professor Alcott will be presenting his research in three segments. We will have pauses after each segment to allow for questions. Professor Alcott, thank you for presenting for us today. Uh, well, thanks for having me. It is great fun to be a part of this distinguished group, including um, uh, it's nice to have a chance to search. Uh, and I just want to make sure I'm unmuted here. Can we? Can you still hear me? Great, fantastic. And can you see my screen, which I'm attempting to share? All right. Um, this paper is joint with uh, Charlie Rackin, uh, who, as you said, is a PhD student at MIT and um, has been fantastic to work with on this. Um, and it's on optimal regulation of e-cigarettes. So the motivation for us, or one way to motivate this paper, is with this um, map, which you may have seen on the Tax Foundation website. And this just looks across states in the U.S and points out that it basically shows the different taxes in different states. And there are lots of interesting features of this map, but one of the things that, one of the things that I think we find very interesting is just the level of disagreement across states. So you can see in gray are states that don't have taxes at all, and then within the, um, the green and teal colors, you see a wide variety of tax rates applied to uh, vapor products. And so I think for us, this raises the question of what the optimal e-cigarette tax would be. And so that's our research question for today. And when I say a social, when I say a tax, uh, I want to be clear that we're going to be considering a negative tax as well. We could be considering uh, a subsidy or even a large subsidy. Um, and this framework will also allow us to consider a ban on e-cigarettes. Um, and that will be in our framework, an infinite tax. You set uh, the tax at an infinitely high level and no one can afford to buy e-cigarettes anymore. Um, 
What does socially optimal mean in the context of our research question? I'll be more precise in a little bit, but uh, broadly what I mean is uh, maximizing societal well-being, taking into account uh, consumer surplus, healthcare costs, and uh, tax revenues. So it basically, uh, takes, it basically uh, is a question of the form, if you ran the world and you were a utilitarian philosopher, what is the tax that you would set? So here's how we're gonna go about answering this question in this paper. Uh, I'll lay out uh, briefly how economists think about optimal corrective uh, taxation, which will be old hat for some of you and newer for others, I think. Uh, we'll then estimate the key parameters of the optimal tax equation. And there are gonna be in particular three parameters that we're gonna focus on. One is the price elasticity of demand. And we're gonna get this from Nielsen scanner data. The second uh, is the effect of e-cigarettes on cigarette smoking, basically asking whether e-cigarettes are a, a complement or a substitute, a uh, gateway drug or a quit aid uh, for smoking. And we're gonna have two approaches to estimating this parameter. One is, uh, again, in the Nielsen scanner data, and then the second is in uh, sample surveys uh, from using data over the last uh, 17 years. Um, and then the third key parameter is gonna be the harms from vaping relative to smoking. And we're gonna get this from a new expert survey that we implemented in August. And some of you um, were actually experts who participated in that survey and we appreciate uh, your uh, participation. So then finally in this paper, we will take the key parameters that we estimate and plug them into the optimal tax framework in order to quantify the optimal tax. And we'll do that in a way that I think uh, does justice to the amount of, um, we'll use Monte Carlo simulations to try to do justice to the amount of uncertainty uh, in this problem. So that's the agenda. Um, in the interest of time, I've just skipped the literature review, which, uh, as I said at the outset, includes uh, a number of papers written by people in this room and um, people who invite us to this seminar, and we, we appreciate the opportunity to build on the shoulders of giants. Um, here's the framework we're going to use. Just to step back for people who are not um, economists in the group, the economic approach to optimal taxation broadly is that we will have a mathematical model of utility, basically an individual's happiness, um, and then what we consume, what products we choose to consume, and we do that, um, and then the things that we consume affect our happiness. Um, there's gonna be a social welfare function, which is just the sum over consumers of their utility. And then using calculus, we're gonna solve for the tax that maximizes social welfare. We're gonna take the maximum of that social welfare function um, uh, by adjusting the tax. So that is broadly what this framework is about. Um, let me just give you um, uh, uh, a bit of insight as to why a tax might be useful here. So there are different kinds of taxes. There are uh, revenue raising taxes like income taxes and property taxes. We're living in a subfield of optimal taxation called corrective taxation, where really the goal here is to correct internalities and externalities. What do I mean by that? So externalities means that the healthcare costs that are caused by my smoking and uh, possibly my vaping are gonna be paid by others. And so when I think about what are the costs of vaping and smoking, I'm, I may not, I don't have the incentive to take that into account. There may also be secondhand smoke or uh, other ways in which my smoking imposes costs or, or benefits on others. Um, in addition to externalities, we will also be considering internalities. Uh, and it's sort of a play on words. Internalities are thought of as a, like an externality that I impose on myself. And that happens because I might not fully consider how vaping uh, or smoking harms my own health. Um, so let me, I, I'm gonna go through this briefly. We have um, all the gory details are laid out in these slides and even more so in, in the paper. Um, and I want to give you just enough of a taste here to understand uh, what's going on. When I say we have a mathematical model of utility and consumption, that's basically what this slide is doing. I have different goods, cigarettes, C, 
e-cigarettes e and a numerator good, which is basically everything else. Um, so there are three goods and they're sold at constant marginal cost and the government has the ability to tax these goods. Um, and so these TAUs, Tau C and Tau E, are the tax rates that the government is setting on cigarettes and e-cigarettes. And we're gonna use a simplified framework, which is known as a Harberger framework, where uh, the government is gonna redistribute uh, the tax revenues uh, via a lump sum transfer back to uh, consumers. Um, and then we have heterogeneous consumers and this variable theta is gonna index the types of consumers. So, um, you know, I am one type of theta. I don't particularly like to smoke or vape. Um, Charlie is a different type of theta. He may have different preferences uh, than I do. Everyone in this uh, seminar is a different theta with different preferences. Um, <clears throat> so I mentioned that they're gonna be, there's gonna be a utility function, uh, which is this U variable, and I've skipped over the exact specification. And I mentioned earlier that social welfare, which I'm denoting W of tau, is just the sum over all consumers of their utility. So that's what this equation is just saying. And if I take the derivative of this uh, function with respect to tau, taking into account that utility depends on consumption, which in turn depends on tau, then I can solve for the optimal tax. And uh, this is what you get when you do that. Um, I've, there are a lot of subscripts and variables in this equation, but I've decided to use colors to, uh, to try to highlight what is most important here. So the left-hand side is tau star E, by which I mean the optimal e-cigarette tax. So think of this as being, you know, in, in cents per milliliter of vaping fluid, for example. The first term in this equation is the average marginal distortion. And the key part of this is an orange, it's that var phi E term. So what do we mean by that? That is the internality and externality caused by vaping. And so if I, um, for example, only focus on the present and don't focus on the future health harms, that would mean that there's a large internality from vaping and that var phi E thing would be large. Similarly, if, I, if vaping imposes large external costs on other people through healthcare um, uh, costs that are borne by others, that would also make var phi E large. Um, we have the intuition that var phi E, that, that these harms from vaping are smaller than the harms from smoking, smoking and we're gonna try to quantify that later. But uh, as long as they're non-zero, that var phi E term is non-zero. Now, the second term in this optimal tax equation uh, is what we call the substitution uh, distortion. And this really hinges on two key things. Um, the first is in red, and that is the difference between the cigarette marginal distortion, that var phi C term, and the cigarette tax. Um, and the second key term is in blue, and that's the substitution between uh, cigarettes and e-cigarettes. What does this say intuitively? Let me just give you an example. It will be optimal to subsidize e-cigarettes if vaping is a substitute for smoking, um, which would play through that blue term and if the cigarette tax is below the average marginal distortion. In other words, cigarettes are really harmful in a way that's not being already incorporated through the cigarette tax. So what we wanna get across here is that then there are gonna be a couple of key statistics that we need to calibrate this optimal tax equation. And they are intuitive, I think, for people working in this space, and they are the parameters that you know, a lot of people are working to try to estimate um, in their own work. Uh, we want to know the own price elasticity and the cross price elasticity of this blue term. So is, is vaping a gateway drug or a quit aid uh, for smoking? And then we just want to know how harmful um, vaping and smoking are. 
And for smoking, we want to figure out uh, more precisely how harmful it is relative to the existing e-cigarette tax rates. So that's going to be the goal for the rest of the talk, is to try to put numbers into this optimal tax formula. And let me pause now just to invite questions. Great, so if there are any audience questions, um, please feel free to share them now. Um, I think the Q&A is clear. Um, so I think we'll, maybe you can proceed and we'll pause again later. Great, I shall proceed. So let's first uh, talk about how we estimate uh, the price elasticity of demand uh, for e-cigarettes. Um, we are going to use an approach uh, that we also share with a couple of uh, the folks here, uh, Mike uh, in particular, and uh, Catherine who invited us here. Um, I have worked on a paper that uh, does uh, a similar approach to this may be familiar to you. In fact, I think Catherine, you presented uh, work that is related to this uh, back in December. Um, so for, our, for, for this uh, paper, the way that we're gonna write this down is that we're gonna use the Nielsen RMS scanner data uh, from 2013 to 2017. So uh, for those of you who, who don't know, Nielsen, aside from gathering TV ratings, also um, works with retailers around the country and um, records the amount of sales of different packaged goods at a variety of supermarkets and convenience stores and um, you know big box stores, et cetera, around the country. And so for groceries, this covers about 40% uh, of the market. For e-cigarettes, this covers only 2.5% of the market uh, in our best guess. And so that's gonna be a key caveat here is that we have great data on only a very small share of the market. And basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna run a regression as you see here where we're gonna regress e-cigarette sales on e-cigarette prices and cigarette prices. And we are going to uh, instrument for those prices using an instrumental variables framework using tax changes that occurred over this sample period. And so intuitively, basically what we're saying is, as the e-cigarette tax went up in a particular state, how much do e-cigarette sales go down in that state relative to the trends that we see in other states where taxes aren't changing? Um, I again want to flag uh, limitations here. Uh, in addition to coverage, um, what we'd really like here is the long run elasticity, and we're getting what I think you might call a medium run elasticity uh, over, you know, a one to two year period. Um, we are also uh, abstracting away from concerns that Reese Jones and Rosama have raised about whether taxes um, affect uh, consumption through awareness or public debate in addition to the price changes. And I'll just show you graphically what we what we get here. Um, this is uh, what's called the first stage of that instrumental variables uh, estimate. On the y-axis, we are looking at how the change in a tax impacts the sale prices of e-cigarettes. On the x-axis, we are looking in an event study framework where period zero is when the tax change occurs. To the left of that is before tax change happens and to the right of that is after the tax change happens. And so what you see here on this figure is as you look a year and a half, a year, two quarters, one quarter before tax change, that tax change is not having the impact on cigarette, on e-cigarette e uh, sale prices, which is exactly what you would hope. After the tax change happens, prices gradually increase and it takes you know, two to three to four quarters for them to reach some new level, um, which is uh, close to but not uh, fully incorporating the um, full impact of the tax change. So the units on the y-axis, these are in log units. 
and uh, uh, and so this the magnitude here is telling us something about the pass through of e-cigarette taxes and e-cigarette prices. So this is saying that the price went up after the tax went up. The other thing we want to know is what's happening to the quantity as the price goes up. So this is that same structure of a figure except with the log of quantity of e-cigarette sales uh, on the left-hand side uh, of the regression and thus on the y-axis of this figure. Before the tax change in the previous six quarters, you can see there's no trend in uh, purchases of uh, e-cigarettes uh, after we control uh, for the set of fixed effects and other controls uh, that we use. Um, and then after the tax change happens, you can see over two to three to four, up to six quarters, you see that quantity uh, goes down by 100 to 120 or so log points. And so uh, what we can do then is we can take the previous slide where we have a price change and this slide where we have a quantity change and effectively we're dividing the two. Um, and we're getting the change in quantity for a given change in price. And that's exactly what the price elasticity is. And so our price elasticity estimate, if I'm remembering correctly, Charlie, is about minus 1.3. And so this is fairly elastic demand for uh, cigarettes. When uh, the price uh, for e-cigarettes, sorry, when the price of e-cigarettes goes up by 10%, the quantity sold of e-cigarettes in these Nielsen RMS stores goes down by 13%. So that's the first uh, key statistic that is gonna be relevant for part of our analysis. Let me take another opportunity here to stop and invite questions. Great, hey, thanks so much. So um, if you have any questions from the audience, um, please proceed or uh, let's see. Uh, we have a question um, about uh, the extent to which consumers might evade taxes by internet purchases, buying in neighboring states, et cetera. Uh, could you speak to uh, could you speak to that, Hunt? Yeah, so that, that matters for a couple of reasons. I think the the first reason why that matters is in our empirical estimates. Um, there, I think, may be some concern about differential evasion or substitution in the RMS stores that are covered by Nielsen compared to the other stores. And so basically, imagine that the RMS stores are really good at collecting those taxes, paying those taxes, and so their prices go up. But meanwhile, I can substitute online um, uh, and buy untaxed e-cigarettes then you might expect demand in the Nielsen data to be more elastic than, you know, than the overall market is. So I think that's one concern with this empirical implementation. There's also a theoretical version of this, which is that our optimal ta tax framework does not include this type of leakage or substitution. Um, to the extent that, um, that a policymaker it is worried about this type of leakage or substitution. Um, the optimal tax that I will show you later um, is an overstatement of what the true optimal tax should be. Intuitively, like there's no reason to charge a $5 tax or a, you know, a massive tax on something if consumers can very easily evade and just buy the same harmful product somewhere else. So that's an important question. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, just another question. Uh, do you take an account of non-tax changes over time, specifically the role of uh, misinformation or risks that may have been occurring? Uh, no. So what we need, so those questions are super, super interesting. Um, what we want to understand in our framework is precisely this price elasticity of demand and in a moment the substitution elasticities. And so those parameters are interesting, but um, they're not going to be relevant for our optimal tax uh, calculation. Uh, just one more quick question about um, the coverage that you have in the Nielsen. Um, is there any thought about sort of that if uh, products differ across the stores that you're cap capturing in Nielsen and other stores that are not captured by Nielsen, there could be missing products. And is that going to be 
important for your analysis? Like different types of yeah. e-cigarette products that you just may not be able to capture in your data. Yeah, so I actually, uh, I'm interested in people's views maybe later, uh, or people are welcome to send, send uh, Charlie or uh, me an email. Um, I would be interested to learn more about what are the types of products that are in, that would be naturally included in the Nielsen data versus excluded and how that might affect our estimates. Um, so it's an important question I don't have a good answer to. Yeah. Uh, great. I have uh, one question about your first event study graph. Would you mind yeah. going back to that? Absolutely. This guy? Yeah, I was just curious, um, the confidence intervals are very small in the pre-period and, and much wider in the, the post-period. Any um, reason for that? What do you think about that? Charlie, do you have an answer off the top of your head? So I'm not entirely sure, but I would, uh, I think that it's plausible that there's just less variation in the pre-period. Uh, and so prices kind of accounting for the state uh, time variation are, are relatively flat. And then afterwards, as prices settle to a new equilibrium, there's some there's additional variation because there's more dispersion. So that could arise if I'm understanding you, Charlie, if some some stores have, you know, 100 percent pass through and other stores have zero percent pass through and, it's, and that sort of thing would would generate this variation. Yeah, it might be okay, cool. uh, one, one idea to look at as well. Um, the pre period, now that I'm thinking about it, maybe you're just using a zero one kind of like in the pre period, and then your post period might be the dollar value of the, the e cigarette tax. Um, and so maybe really the pre period coefficient should be more like the average tax in the post period to make the confidence intervals like symmetrical. Um, that, that might be part of it as well. But not a, not a major point. In general, I think the patterns all look reasonable to me. Okay, cool. Yeah, thanks for that idea, Mike. Um, uh, sorry, one quick, one more clarifying yeah. question, if you could, if you have a moment. I uh, have a question. If you could speak about how you uh, are converting the e-cigarettes, the e which different localities have passed in different ways, ad valorem, et cetera. Could you speak to how you standardize across these these different types of taxes? Yeah, let me let Charlie speak to that too, because he he really did the nitty gritty of it. Yeah, so this is an important concern, which is that we need to standardize uh, the, the taxes per to kind of a consistent uh, set of units. So uh, what we do for a number of different uh, UPCs, which are kind of the different products, is we have a crosswalk that uh, generates the number of milliliters of vaping liquid for each product on average, and then Using that, we can convert that to the per uh, the tax per milliliter for the ad valorem taxes, and so that gives us a consistent unit. Uh, and so then there are other one there are other types of taxes that are a fraction of the retail price or a fraction of the wholesale price. And for those, you know, we're able to observe the retail price, and then we can use that to back out what the wholesale price would be. And the details for the particulars there are in the paper. Great. So let me press ahead. And so, and Catherine, what time um, am I going to stop and hand this over to Mike? Uh, Mike's going to kind of pepper in some comments uh, as he has been at, at your pauses. So, um, well, if we can go to maybe uh, leaving maybe 15 or so minutes, 10 minutes at the end for some uh, final questions, that would be just great. But he'll just jump in when uh, you're at your pauses. Okay, got it. Great. Fantastic. So uh, let me move to this next key parameter, which is the uh, effect of e-cigarettes on cigarette smoking. Um, let me first tell you some of the data that we're going to work with. In addition to the Nielsen data, um, we're going to work with the major, all of the um, major smoking and vaping sample surveys that have annual data and ask um, questions on uh, on vaping and smoking. So that is this list of five surveys, um, three for adults uh, and three for youth. So this is going to end up being um, 7.4 million individual observations uh, over this 15-year uh, period. 
and they're going to be weighted using the sampling weights that, that were given. Uh, and basically, the key questions that are being asked are how many days did you vape in the last 30 days? Um, how many packs per day do you smoke? Um, or in the case of, of Burfus, um, it is, uh, as many of you know, less detailed than that. Do you smoke or vape every day, some days, uh, or not at all? So we're going to take those and map those um, into uh, consumption figures. Um, so let me give you some of the intuition for what this approach is, again, without going into the gory details. Uh, there has been, uh, of course, this rapid rise in vaping. This is uh, using sales in, in billions of dollars uh, of vapor products in the U.S. And um, we're going to think of... Um, we're, we're going to think of, of vaping as really taking off around 2013. And this is just, you know, our loose interpretation of how, of how this figure looks. Um, and so I'm going to, uh, our Charlie has put in this red vertical line to sort of orient us to when vaping really starts to, um, to take off. Now, we can also do this uh, sort of figure for smoking, for cigarette sales. Um, and of course, cigarette uh, sales are declining over time uh, in the U.S. from about 20 uh, billion packs per year in 2004 to about 12 billion packs um, in, the, uh, in 2018. The thing we want you to notice here is actually an insight from the Levy et al. 2018 tobacco control uh, paper. It's called the Reality Check, which some of you may know. Um, but we're going to take that intuition and run with it in the following way. So we can calculate uh, what a dollar of vaping gets you in terms of nicotine or usual consumption and put that into cigarette pack units. And if, you know, using just a back of the envelope calculation, we could say that if, if a day of vaping um, at typical rates is a perfect complement for a day of smoking at typical rates, or alternatively, as a perfect substitute, cigarette sales would have gone up or down by 1.5 billion packs per year. So I'm just going to take, uh, again, uh, Charlie and I have taken this sales number for vape for e-cigarette products, you know, turn that into a dollar per milliliter, figured out how much nicotine is in a milliliter and translated this into cigarette packs. And you could do this yourself and you may get slightly different numbers, but if they were perfect substitutes, our calculation is that this cigarette smoking trend would have bent down or bent up by 1.5 billion packs per year. So in other words, if all of these, if all this vaping was a gateway drug to more smoking, this cigarette line would have started to bend up by as much as 1.5 billion packs per year. Alternatively, if all of this vaping was perfectly replacing smoking, so it was a perfect quit aid and it was not a gateway drug for anybody, this smoking line would have bent down by 1.5 billion packs per year. So uh, there are no standard errors on this graph, but this is just to sort of motivate this, and you can do a visual uh, trend study here, and it's not clear, or it, to me at least, it seems pretty clear that this is not bending up or down relative to its previous trend by as much as 1.5 billion packs per year in either direction. Now, we can do this time series in the, um, um, let, let's, let's go to the self-report data for youth. So this is monitoring the future uh, National Survey of Drug Use um, and Health, and the National Youth Tobacco uh, Survey. And we've got the cigarette use self-reports in this left panel, and the e-cigarette use self-reports in the right panel. And again, this is for youth. And these y-axes are oriented such that um, at, at least at adult consumption levels, they're comparable. And so you would expect that if e-cigarette use is going up by, um, you know, uh, from 0% of days to 6% of days, 
that should bend down this cigarette use line uh, or this cigarette use trend. And again, that's not something that you're seeing. So this is, so our strategy here is beginning with this Levy et al. 2018 insight. What we're gonna do next is say, well, of course, you might be worried that there are other trends that are happening over this period in cigarette consumption. There's a change in the national cigarette tax in 2009 that's pretty large. There are changes in state level cigarette taxes and um, anti-smoking information campaigns, et cetera, it's change in social norms, et cetera. And so we'd like to do something more than just this time trend. And so to do this, we're gonna build on this insight that different demographic groups are uh, more or less likely to uh, smoke or vape. And so this is uh, the results of a regression where we regress uh, in the sample surveys, how much do you vape or what share of days do you vape on a vector of demographic coefficient. Uh, we've got um, the race and ethnicity, uh, variables. We've got men versus women, education, income, and age. Uh, vaping differs a lot by age groups, a little bit by income, uh, somewhat by education. Um, uh, uh, white people are substantially more likely or significantly, statistically significantly more likely to vape than uh, other demographic groups, men um, more so than women. And so what we can do with these demographic, this demographic variation then is that we can split the population of the U.S. into high vaping propensity and low vaping propensity groups. And we can look at the relative smoking trend for those two groups. And let me just, in the interest of time, I'm just going to show you one picture of this um, to uh, give you a sense of how uh, it works. So this is for adults. We've broken the, this is the same style of figure that I showed you before with cigarette smoking trends by year on the left and vaping um, by year in the years when it's available uh, on the right. And then we've got above median vaping demographics. So this tends to be men, younger people, um, white people, and below median vaping demographics, which is everybody else. Um, and you can see on the right that the above median vaping demographics are indeed more likely to vape, um, and that's just mechanical. But then what we wanna do is look at the relative trends in smoking for these two groups. And we basically wanna say, um, there's some downward trend for the high vapors, there's some downward trend in smoking for the low vapors, and we want to ask if these relative trends are changing in the recent five years as vaping becomes more common. If vaping, again, is a complement, if it's a gateway drug to smoking, then you would expect these high vaping demographics to start smoking more relative to this low vaping demographic control group. On the other hand, if vaping is primarily a substitute, a quit aid for combustible cigarettes, you would expect this uh, smoking line here for the high vapors to start trending down as they substitute away from smoking. And again here, the relative difference between these two lines is not changing very much. And so this is really the key figure that is driving our conclusions that vaping and smoking are not strong substitutes or complements on average. So some people are using vaping as a quit aid, some people uh, are finding vaping to be a, a gateway drug, but on average, we are finding um, statistically close to zero complementarity or substitutability. Um, so that's, that's the end of that section. What I'd actually like to do, Catherine, if it's all right, is press on into the final uh, key piece of our analysis, and then, and, and then we can take more of the questions at the end. Is that, is that all right? Sure, that sounds just great. Cool. So the, the final key piece of the, uh, of the analysis is to understand the harms from vaping relative to smoking, right? So the higher these harms are from vaping, the higher the optimal um, uh, e-cigarette tax is gonna be, or if vaping is basically harmless, 
then, um, then that tax is going to be very low. So we did an expert survey, which again, some of you participated in, um, motivated for the following reasons. There's a lot of disagreement among experts as to how harmful vaping is. We wanted to be able to quantify that. The research has evolved rapidly, even, even since the uh, 2018 National Academy of Sciences report. Um, E-cigarette products are evolving. Um, and finally, we wanted a quantitative, we need a quantitative estimate of the relative harms uh, to go into this optimal tax calculation. It's not enough to rely on a statement that vaping is substantially less harmful. We actually need a number to put into the tax formula. So um, <clears throat> we fielded a, uh, so the, we fielded this survey to a, a large group of experts. We basically tried to find a list of several hundred, um, uh, we wanted to find an authoritative list of um, the leading experts on the health effects of vaping and smoking. And so you can see here, we use people who contribute to the National Academy of Sciences or Surgeon General's uh, studies reports, uh, people who are on TIPSAC, people who are fellows of uh, SRNT, people who edit um, some of the, the, the three, uh, three of the leading journals, as well as people we had cited in our, um, our previous drafts. So that's our sample frame. We have a completion rate of 31%, uh, percent, uh, which um, is much less than 100, but I actually found very impressive uh, given such uh, a busy uh, set of experts. So here's what we did in the survey. We said um, we wanted to fix ideas. We needed to fix ideas about what we mean by the health effects of vaping relative to smoking. Um, in order to do this in a quantitative way. So what we did is uh, we used this language here. We said to be concrete, we want you to predict the effects of a hypothetical randomized trial um, where a smoking group will smoke a pack of cigarettes a day, a vaping group will vape a comparable amount of nicotine using typical e-cigarettes, and a control group won't do either one of them. And this is hypothetical. I'm not sure that uh, it's clear that we couldn't get this trial approved um, and there would be all sorts of problems with it. Um, and uh, so, so that much is clear. But we're using this uh, hypothetical trial as a intellectual vehicle to elicit experts' beliefs. Okay, the key question we use is if smoking a pack per day reduces quality adjusted life expectancy compared to the control group by 100 units, so if smoking harms your health by 100 units, by how many units do you think vaping would affect quality-adjusted life expectancy? So this is going to be our key number for understanding the relative um, quality effect uh, of vaping. We give people some examples. We give people a graphical illustration. Um, and then we, uh, and we ask parallel questions for other types of diseases. So this is the distribution of our key set of results. So this is a histogram of people's responses to that question, um, where one on this figure is that vaping is just as bad as smoking, and zero is that vaping imposes zero health harms. And a key benchmark is 0 0.05, which is the result of some previous research, uh, including the Public Health uh, England report, which have, have concluded that vaping is only, uh, it's safe to say, they say loosely, that vaping might be uh, less than 5% as harmful as smoking. This histogram makes very clear that the experts who responded to our survey um, do not agree with that assessment. The average of this is about 0.37, um, and, but you can also see there's a lot of disagreement. Um, from here, um, it's then crucial to understand why is it that our experts seem to disagree with this 5% as harmful prior assessment uh, in the Public Health England report uh, and also uh, in a study which some of you may know uh, by Nutt et al. in uh, 2014, which was another expert elicitation. Um, the key question here that we asked is why is it that you disagree with those prior assessments. So we said, remember that the prior assessments were that vaping is only 5% as harmful. 
here, multiple choice, check all that apply, why do you disagree? And the answers that we got are e-cigarettes are different in the US, there's new research evidence available since these studies were done, I disagree with the researchers' interpretation of the evidence, e-cigarette devices have changed. Um, so there um, are a series of reasons that, ex that the experts in our survey gave as to why they disagreed with the prior um, assessments. Uh, so in the interest of time, um, I uh, will um, uh, pause. So let me pause here, actually, and we can talk about the expert survey. I think that might be a good thing to do. So are there questions or comments on the expert survey? Well, I, I have a few uh, questions. I could jump in right now if that if that would um, if that would be okay. Um, uh, both on Great. the expert survey and just on some of the the method stuff um, leading up to that. Um, so I, I was curious uh, um, uh, why you guys didn't include the youth risk behavior surveillance system as one of the youth uh, uh, data sources. Um, and in particular, I have noticed um, I have looked at at if there's any kind of evidence of. Um, uh, of a change in trends kind of around the time that e-cigarettes became available in the, the YRBSS. Um, and I did see some evidence, like if you start like 2003 and look from 2003 to 2011, you see like a 63% a 60 decline in youth cigarette use. And then from, um, from 2011 to 2019, uh, I'm sorry, you see, you see a 60% 60, 60 decline from 2011 to 2019 around the time that e-cigarettes were available. But if you look in the early 2000s, you see a much uh, smaller decline in that survey. So, so that might just be a, a potential useful additional data source to integrate into your, your model. Charlie, do you remember, I believe that we used all surveys that we thought were relevant. It could be that YRBSS is only every two years or they didn't have the right smoking or vaping questions. We looked into using the YRBSS. I think what we found is that it was uh, at sufficiently infrequent intervals, uh, which I don't remember off the top of my head, that it would make that it uh, wasn't clean to incorporate into the analysis, but it's the type of thing that we could, you know, explore extending the analysis to include. Yeah, it's it's every two years. Um, and they now have, I guess, the wire BSS goes to 2018. So you do have three years of three waves of data with e-cigarette questions in it at, at this point. So that might be a nice contribution to the um, to the uh, to the paper. Um, and then uh, I guess uh, with the um, you know with the modeling, um, uh, I noticed like when you add this the the state uh, specific kind of time trends into the model, um, one of one of your key in, uh, inputs into kind of your optimal tax model then um, is the um, the effect of the cigarette prices on e-cigarette consumption, right? Um, and uh, it seems like this the state specific time trends makes a big difference in the uh, the magnitude of that estimate. And I think when you add the state specific time trends, the estimate uh, uh, is about halved. Um, and so I guess I know you're going to go into the optimal tax work later, but I, I was wondering if, um, if you've uh, considered using um, different, different, um, uh, different kind of inputs from different models, controlling or not controlling for the, the time trends in, in that work. Yeah, it's a super important question. And, and so obviously there, the, so in our in our estimates, Mike, as you say, we have um, state or it's actually a cluster, I think, specific uh, time, effectively state specific time trends. And that is not necessarily a best practice in doing this sort of event study um, work. The reason we have them is that um, was a judgment call based on looking at, at some of the event study figures where those time trends seem to help us somewhat to address uh, pre-existing trends in the uh, in states uh, in consumption in states before cigarette taxes are imposed. Um, so that that's why we have those. The we do present all kinds of heterogeneous uh, sorry um, alternative parameter assumptions in our uh, welfare now in our policy analysis table, um, including different assumptions about. Um, uh, that substitution parameter. So I, I do think we're well uh, taken care of uh, there in terms of how we present that uncertainty. But um, yeah, I think th that does definitely make an, a difference in some of the estimates. 
And then I guess my, my final uh, uh, comment um, uh, was just uh, thinking about like self-selection uh, issues with kind of the, the panel of, of experts, right? Um, and so like who is really an expert on the health harms of uh, the relative risks of cigarettes versus e-cigarettes, right? I mean, are they people that are publishing that maybe are unfamiliar with these products or are they people, you know, that are actually smokers and vapors and um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. I think you can make a good case that, um, you know, both groups of people maybe have unique, important knowledge, right? Um, and so, I, I, you know, I, I am aware with kind of, you know, some of the, the, the groups of people that you're serving and that kind of thing. I mean, there's, you know, uh, conflicts of interest in some case against presenting, you know, uh, against uh, presenting work suggesting that e-cigarettes maybe are substantially safer than, than cigarettes, right? Um, and so just, I was just curious what your, your thoughts are on, on that issue. Yeah, so who gets to call himself or herself an expert is, is, a, is a big, a deep question. Um, you know, our, our hope here, and I, I've put back up, I've shared the screen again with our, with our sample frame. Our goal was to get um, uh, unconflicted, uh, experts, you know, from recognized um, scholarly um, places. And so, and to be clear, we have removed from this list, I should have said this on the slide, we've removed from this list anybody who um, works uh, for a tobacco company. So there are some people on TIPSAC who um, are at tobacco companies and those people were not uh, included in the, in the survey data that I'm presenting. Um, so yeah, we just we wanted to we wanted to find people who you know if I show you this list you would say oh yeah I think of this as a fair way of getting a list of uh, of experts. You know, I mean, just there could be conflicts on the other side though too, right? I mean, not just conflicts, of course, from people being funded by tobacco, but then also conflicts from people that have an incentive to be opposed to tobacco as well, right? I guess that's my point, yeah. I guess. But no further comments. Great. Uh, just one quick follow up from the audience on the, the expert survey from uh, Ken Warner. Just wondering if you have done any work where you've sort of categorized the experts into different, into different disciplines. Um, Ken notes that experts may include people like him, and I would certainly include myself in this level where we don't have specific training in health. Are you able to kind of parse out across different groups? Yes. Um, and this uh, slide here, slide number 47,000. Uh, has, a, has a couple of comments on that. Um, we know how many publications our experts have self-reported. There's no relationship between alpha, where alpha is the relative harms from vaping. There's no relationship between how harmful you think vaping is and your number of publications. Um, we find that uh, we've also um, separated the experts into uh, uh, economists uh, and, and what we'll call public health experts. Um, so for example, Mike is in the uh, economist um, group and Catherine, I believe you were in our expert survey as well. You were in the economist group. Um, and public health experts are more pessimistic about vaping than economists are. So that, that's uh, what we've done so far there. Great, thank you. Uh, just in the uh, essence of time, we've got about seven minutes left. So I'll, I'll push on and we can have, hopefully have some time for more questions at the end, but thank you. Yeah, sure. Let me let me just show you our key um, our key optimal tax result. So we're going to take the parameters that uh, we have estimated here, and we're going to combine these with uh, assumptions about the absolute harms from cigarette smoking. Um, and in particular, let me go to that slide. Uh, the smoking externality of 64 cents per pack we're going to take from Sloan et al. 2004 as adjusted by, by the recent um, uh, JEL uh, uh, coverage of that um, to take away um, a particular form of externality from life insurance that's no longer there. So we're at 64 cents per pack externality. Um, and then we're going to take internalities from some other papers. We're going to focus on present bias as the internality, and we're going to make an assumption about how present bias uh, people are, and then apply that to the private health cost of smoking. 
of $44 uh, per pack, which basically derives from the amount of life years uh, people tend to lose multiplied by a value of a statistical life. So having done those things, we can then show you the optimal cigarette tax using Monte Carlo simulations to demonstrate um, the amount of uncertainty. So this is a histogram of results from Monte Carlo simulations. Um, the X axis here is the optimal e-cigarette tax in dollars per milliliter. Um, the place I want to focus you here is this vertical line. That is um, just about 80, 80 some uh, cents per milliliter. That is the average um, e-liquid tax in the jurisdictions that currently have e-liquid taxes. And uh, so you can see that there's some mass below that. There's some possibility that uh, that is too high. But um, there's also a lot of mass, and in fact, most of the mass is to the right of that, saying that um, in all likelihood, our model suggests that um, the current norm uh, uh, for e-cigarette taxes is too low, and certainly a zero e-cigarette tax, which is most prevalent around the country, um, is, is also very likely to have been uh, too low. Uh, most of this uncertainty comes from the health harms. Um, and in particular, it comes from how harmful are cigarettes, and then how harmful uh, in the expert survey are e-cigarettes relative to cigarettes. And so I showed you the histogram of expert beliefs and experts disagree a lot. It's really that expert disagreement on how harmful vaping is uh, that is then generating a lot of the dispersion in this um, optimal tax um, calculation. You can even get a subsidy to be optimal. And in fact, a very heavy subsidy if you rely on the results from people like Kip Viscusi, who has shown that people tend to um, overestimate how harmful vaping is, even relative to our experts. And so, in that world, if you if you want um, if you in that world, you might want to heavily subsidize e-cigarettes to signal to people and also to lower the prices in order to offset the fact that people um, incorrectly believe that e-cigarettes are more harmful than they actually are. So that's the key policy result. Let me conclude. Um, we showed you this optimal tax framework where uh, the optimal tax depends on intuitive statistics, the health harms, the substitution of smoking, and the un uninternalized harms from smoking. We uh, delivered some estimates of the key parameters uh, for this um, framework, uh, including the e-cigarette demand elasticity, uh, this demographic analysis um, of vaping, uh, showing that vaping is neither a substantial complement or substitute to smoking. Um, and then this new expert survey uh, that quantifies experts' beliefs about the harms from uh, smoking, uh, from vaping relative to smoking. Um, and then in our calculation, we showed you that uh, to offset plausible levels of present bias that have been used in the literature, you probably want a higher optimal e-cigarette tax than is currently um, the norm. But there's a lot of uncertainty around that. And, uh, you know, the key thing that would narrow that Monte Carlo distribution that would give us more certainty about optimal policy is just more research on the externalities and internalities uh, from vaping. So thanks again for these comments. I have time to stick around after uh, the next two minutes as well. Uh, so I'm happy to hear people's, people's comments and thanks again. Great, thanks. So maybe what we'll do is we'll take um, a couple of questions from the audience and then uh, we'll, and again, if anyone else would like to ask some questions, please do so. Uh, Abby Friedman asked she, uh, that there's a wide range in conventional cigarette taxes from the U.S. Uh, from about $1.18 to over $6. How does the optimal e-cigarette tax look at the bounds of this distribution? Oh, I see. So if I'm understanding you correctly, Abby, you're saying the optimal e-cigarette tax depends on this substitution distortion. So like how big are the uninternalized um, uh, harms from smoking, right? Because Abby, you're asking about the cigarette, the variation in cigarette taxes, is that correct? I think so, yes. Yeah. So it turns out that that, that, um, that, that doesn't matter very much. And actually, let me go back to the formula just to illustrate this. So this is the optimal tax formula that, that I put up before that Charlie and I have 
derived using the standard framework. So this second term, the substitution distortion, is basically saying how much does the uninternalized harm from, from cigarettes play into determining the optimal e-cigarette tax? And it's the product, stripping away some of these other terms, it's really the product of the amount of substitution times the uninternalized harm. Um, and so Abby's question is basically saying, if we were to make this tau C, the cigarette tax really large or really small to accommodate the variation that we see across states, how does that play into tau E? So the answer is not very much, and it's because this term, the substitution, the change in cigarettes with respect to a change in e-cigarette price, this term is actually small in the sense of it's dwarfed by the e-cigarette distortion term. And so I can change, we can change around tau C or var phi C quite a bit and change around this, this red term. And because it's multiplying this blue term, which is kind of small, it actually doesn't impact the optimal e-cigarette tax very much. So what really matters for the e-cigarette tax in our estimation is, um, is what's going on with e-cigarettes, how harmful they are. The converse of that statement is also true. So we can take the current estimate of the, of the red term and make the blue term really big or really small at sort of the bounds of what people might think are reasonable for, you know, a gateway effects or quitting effects. And still the substitution distortion term is, is outweighed because this orange term is so big. Great, thank you. Uh, just a question from Jody Sindelar. She indicates that, you know, there are, your data run through 2018, um, but there are, there's been a lot of changes in the e-cigarette uh, market very recently. Um, do you think that adding in additional data and particular things about Juul withdrawing some of its flavors, do you think that might have an impact on your, your estimate to your optimal taxation? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. And that's really why we wanted to do this expert survey on top of the existing Public Health England and, and National Academy of Sciences reports. Um, a, a, the National Academy of Sciences report doesn't deliver the quantitative number that, that, that we need, but also, you know, the research in that is, is a couple years old now. And indeed, our experts said that their views have been influenced by changes in the products um, in the last couple years. And so, our survey is very recent, right? It's only a couple months old. And so we think that it accommodates uh, those changes when thinking about the harms from vaping. Uh, the other reason why recent data help is um, what you can see here. There's just been a big increase because of Juul, a big increase in the amount of vaping in 2018 and then, then uh, presumably in the 2019 data as, as well, which we don't have in here yet. Um, and that does help us to reduce our standard errors in this uh, analysis that I was showing you earlier. Thank you. Okay, we are out of time. Thank you, Professor Alcott, for the presentation and to the moderator and discussant. Finally, thank you to the audience of 115 people for your participation. Our next seminar speaker will be Dr. Frank Leone, giving a presentation on January 21st titled Tobacco Dependence Treatment in Behavioral Health. After leaving the seminar, you'll have an opportunity to complete a survey on your satisfaction with the seminar today. We appreciate the feedback. You will also receive an email with instructions for how you can receive a certificate for your attendance today. Thanks again for participating and have a top-notch top weekend.